This is a program about monuments. It doesn't look as if I'm going to run out of ones to look at. It's a sad thing to say, but there are a few things that I like better than a wander in a graveyard. I've demonstrated this disturbing tendency before on the television, but here I am again, lurking among the gravestones. The trouble is, I just find them fascinating. They can be funny, touching, informative, and sometimes even downright gigantic. Fascinated by the people that you meet on these gravestones. I mean, look at that one. Anne Johnson, coach proprietor of this town. Women are nearly always just wives or daughters, but there's a Victorian working woman. place of John and Margaret Morrison, inventor of transparent plaster. Did they both invent it? Were they one person? And what on earth is transparent plaster? I don't know. Perhaps it's one of those things that you stick on your arm when you've got a cut. The materials that people choose for their graves is interesting too. Some like granite, because it's hard and lasts a long time. Local sandstone, of course, that's much the most common of all materials, but this, that's very unusual. I don't think I've ever seen an iron grave before. This is a monument to a group of workers who were killed in an accident at an ironworks. So anyway, this program is about monuments. First of all, about private monuments. Monuments of private remembrance, of which there are thousands huddled together in this rather extraordinary cemetery. This is Jesmond Old Cemetery in Newcastle, which was designed in 1836 by John Dobson here. He was buried in his own backyard, so to speak. Now, 1836 is a very early date for a big public cemetery. The very first one in the country, which is Kensal Green in London, was only opened in 1830. So this one is right up there among the very first. Obviously, there had been burial grounds around churches in towns for centuries, but by the 19th century, two things were happening, which led to the creation of new, what should I call them, parks of death, perhaps. First of all, most of the old churchyards were becoming pretty well stuffed to the gunnels with bodies, and the explosion of town populations with the Industrial Revolution meant that it was getting desperately difficult to find places to bury people. It was very dangerous, especially during epidemics. So corporations started to look for nice greenfield sites which they could use to ease the pressure. But secondly, there was a change of taste. I don't know how to describe it, really. It was almost as if there was a cult of death, a desire to celebrate mournful things, and an absolute fascination with symbols and images of death. Places like this were laid out deliberately like parks. They were sort of melancholy theme parks with added sculpture. I love the styles that they chose for their monuments broken columns to represent the end of something. They went to ancient Greece for images of draped urns and to ancient Rome for sarcophagi. They chose obelisks from ancient Egypt and Celtic crosses from our own historic past. They mined the whole history of Europe in order to find their symbolism. 
You'd be hard pushed to find better places to study the taste, and especially the sculptural taste, of the last couple of hundred years. Well, I've left Newcastle now and I've come way south to the East Riding of Yorkshire, deep in the Yorkshire Walls, which I always think is one of the least well-known but most atmospheric landscapes in Britain. And it's well endowed with spiffing monuments. This is South Dalton Church, which I've really come to because of something that's inside. But you can't come to somewhere as wonderful as this without pausing for a spot of admiration. It was designed by one of the greatest of all Victorian architects. He was called J.L. Pearson, John Loughborough Pearson, to give him his full works. And his churches are always, well, like this really, very pure and noble, and he really did like a nice spire. This one's about two miles high, I believe. Okay, now it's time to see what lurks within. If you want to see great art, you can always go to museums or great art galleries. That's especially true of painting. But sculpture, if you want to see great sculpture, you would be a plank, nay, a super plank, to avoid the parish churches of England. Because the rich people of England have always had enough money to be able to hire the finest sculptors to carve their funeral monuments. This was carved by one of England's finest sculptors, a man called Caius G. Sibber. And the figure is of Sir John Hotham, who, as you can see from his garb and his accoutrements, if that's the word I'm looking for, was a military chap. In fact, he was the governor of Hull in the 17th century. And in a sense, he was the man who started the English Civil War because he was the one who refused to let the king enter into Hull. He said, no, nah. he says, you can get lost. We want no kings in here. I've made up the dialogue a little bit there, but that's more or less what he's famous for. And now here he is, dead. He died in 1689, though I'm not sure you would think he was dead at all, looking at him here, just having a nice little lie down on the sofa, perhaps, feeling pleased with himself for snubbing the king. Not dead at all. Oh, but look at him now. Now that is dead. Isn't that bizarre? The point, of course, is to remind us of how short life is and how long death is or possibly to remind us that the body doesn't matter because it'll rot away anyhow. The women are virtues, the very pretty virtues actually. It's a sad life when you start fancying statues. This is Justice bearing her mighty sword and next to her is Temperance with her water pitcher. She'd have to have it in a little plastic bottle if she was carved nowadays. Now isn't that a curious monument? I think it's impossible to fully understand nowadays what something like this means. Because the past, as L.P. Hartley wrote, is a foreign country that do things differently there. It's difficult to conceive of celebrating the life of a famous person like this. But the quality is superb. It might be odd, but it's unforgettable. All of the monuments that we've looked at so far have been very much acts of private memorial. Even Sir John Hotham, however impressive his tomb, is still in his local church, planned and paid for by his widow. But I think the time has come now to move on to a brand new world of public monuments. And that means, first of all, posh chaps on plinths.
a lot of public monuments to famous chaps. Doesn't look as if we're going to run out of those, does it? However, I think I can guarantee you that there'll only be one more famous gadget on a plinth in the course of this programme, and he won't appear until later on. In the meantime, I have an exceedingly public monument to bring to your attention. This is the Tatton Sykes Memorial at Garton on the Wold, and you can't get much more public than that, as we can demonstrate with shots from afar. So go, cameraman, seek out your finest shots, do your best, let there be art, dear boy. <laughs> A hundred and twenty feet high, thirty-seven metres, and fancy, very fancy. This is the very public monument to a man called Sir Tatton Sykes, who died in 1863. Now, I suspect that 98.7% of you have never heard of Sir Tatton Sykes and wonder what he can possibly have done to deserve this. The answer is not that much, not on a national scale anyway. He did a fair bit locally, I suppose. You can see from this relief on the monument what he was remembered for. He was an agricultural improver, spent a lot of money improving the farms and building villages on his estates. But then, of course, he made a lot of money out of them as well. He was the local bigwig, in fact. So he got a nice big sticky uppy thing when he died. I have to admit that I don't get a lot out of this sort of monument. I like it all right. It, it amuses me because it's an example of Victorian design at its most ludicrously OTT, but I certainly don't admire it. I don't see why you should get a massive monument to you just because you're rich. I'm not wild about posh men on plinths, and I'm not wild about this either. In fact, in rather controversial style, I intend to crush it, and by inference, lots of statues of posh chaps on podia beneath the great boot of history. I can't do it. This is a smashing object and he was probably a nice bloke. They obviously liked him at the time, so I'm not going to crush him. But I have to say that I infinitely prefer two monuments to more ordinary folk, which are to be found at Sir Tatton's home village, not a million inches from here. Approximately 980,000 inches, if the truth be known. That's how far it is from the Tatton Sykes Memorial to Sledmere because this is where he lived. His house is just over there, Sledmere Hall. It's a lovely house, well worth a visit, but not now, for we have monuments to see. As you can see, this is a gorgeous village. It's what you would call an estate village, nestled around the big house, and all rebuilt over the years by the lords of the manor. Now, they also provided a couple of monuments worthy of our undivided attention for a moment or two. This first one's called the Eleanor Cross. Not because it's a real Eleanor Cross, but because it looks like one. I need to explain. Real Eleanor Crosses were put up to commemorate the death of Queen Eleanor, who was the wife of Edward I. And she died in 1291 in the Midlands. I think it was near Northampton. And her body was taken with great pomp and circumstance to London to be buried at Westminster Abbey. But it took several days to get there what with the state of the roads and all, and so everywhere that the coffin rested for the night, the king put up a cross in her memory. So this isn't a real one, it's a copy put up in 1896 as a village cross, a sort of focus of interest at the heart of the village. But then, in 1920, it was cunningly given a second life as the village war memorial. These rather beautiful extra pictures were added, and the various brass commemoration plaques. I think it makes rather a beautiful war memorial, but not as remarkable as the village's other war memorial.
This is the Wagoners Memorial, which is my favourite war memorial in the whole country. It was carved by a man called Carlo Magnini in what's almost a comic book style. It's incredibly charming and homespun, and I love it. It was erected in memory of the thousand wagon drivers of the Wagoners Reserve, who all came from around about here, from farms all over the Yorkshire Wolds, to drive horse-drawn wagons to the trenches in the First World War. The advert that invited them to recruit promised them 35 shillings a week plus a separation allowance, and it said that joining the Wagoners Reserve was the quickest way to get to the front. Now there's a temptation for you. We in the army can offer you chaps the quickest way to get shot. But they joined, and they died, and here they are, stalwart, upstanding Brits, faced by an unspeakable and barbaric foe. I suspect that this astonishing stereotyping of the wicked hun uh, would be quite illegal nowadays, but fortunately you can't really censor monuments, so they remain just that. Monuments to the taste of their own age. Odd, foreign, fascinating. I did say that this programme was going to contain one more posh chap on a plinth. I didn't say that the plinth was about three quarters of a mile high and contains about four million steps. <sighs> Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. I've just come up here to the top of Gray's Monument in the middle of Newcastle, lest you should have failed to recognise it, in order to muse on the purpose of monuments. All of the monuments that I've shown in this programme have been massively expensive. Anybody who's even put up a simple gravestone to a family member knows how much money's involved. This one, I don't know how much it cost, but it must have been a fortune. The money was raised to celebrate him. Earl Grey, Prime Minister of Britain, and local Earl who was responsible for the Great Reform Act of 1832. So he had three reasons to get this plinth. Local Earl, Prime Minister, Reform Act. You can't do much better than that. But still, was it worth the money? Is it ever worth the money? I'm afraid it is. All monuments are worth it if they're good enough and if they're in the right place. This one commemorates an impressive local man and a hugely impressive moment in British political history. And as such, it's an appropriate source of local pride. But it also looks marvellous here. For 170 years, it has provided a focus for the centre of Newcastle, a culmination for the beautiful Grey Street. It's given Geordies somewhere to meet and helped shape the identity of the city. You can't pay too much money for qualities like that. And fortunately, a lot of people nowadays seem to have learnt that lesson. Gateshead, for example. Gateshead's always had an image problem. It's always been seen as Newcastle's poor relation, but there's no question that that's changing. And part of the reason is that the council has had the nous to recognise that monuments create identity and change perception. If you can get good enough monuments, monuments like the Angel of the North, which expresses in its iron and its strength and solidity, its industrial beauty, everything that Northeasterners have always liked to think about themselves, then they're worth every penny they cost. Gateshead's not the only town to discover the power of monuments, and the discovery isn't new either. South Shields realised a hundred years ago that a monumental piece of architecture would raise its image and give it a new status at the start of the 20th century, and they also realised the power of art, public art, so they festooned the town hall with pretty pics, some of them disturbingly pretty. 
South Tyneside is another of those councils, like Gateshead, which has continued to see the value of public art and monuments. And they've commissioned new pieces all over the borough. The spirit of South Tyneside is one of my favourites. It's an unmonumental monument. It's witty and fun, witty and pretty and fun, in fact, and there's not enough of that in art nowadays. But this is my absolute favourite. Conversation piece by the late Juan Nunes. Totally gorgeous and uh, so approachable. I watched three generations of a family play football around these figures the other day, as if they were rather overweight and static defenders, or Leeds United players as we call them. <laughs> I've seen children holding their hands and talking to them. I've done it myself, you know. This is my favourite local monument, and I'm going to give it a Grundy's Wonder. with North East England. Passionate people, passionate places.